Hi, and welcome back to our channel Summaries of a Bookworm. Your number one play, the most important and widely read example of elegiac poetry in 18th century English literature, Thomas Gray's Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard, is Gray's response to seeing a village churchyard near his mother's house in the small village of Stoke Poges in England. Gray's meditation on mortality and remembrance among the common people of England's rural, agricultural society was inspired by the pastoral scene. Gray concludes his investigation on a personal note. Gray describes himself from a distance as an observer, an old villager, and reveals how he hopes to be remembered by writing his own epitaph. Elegy, written in a country churchyard, which Gray began writing in 1742 and published in 1751, is widely regarded as the best example of elegiac poetry in 18th-century English literature. Gray's elegy explores the nature of mortality and remembrance, as well as the poet's own perspective on how he wants to be remembered. Gray wrote two versions, the first in 1742, following the death of his friend Richard West, and the second in 1748, following the death of an aunt. The published poem of 1751 contains significant revisions, most notably a shift in focus at the end of the poem to Gray's own reflections on how future generations will remember him as a poet. Elegies are typically poems about a specific person's death, such as Milton's Lycidas, but Gray uses the elegiac form to explore death as a universal experience that mankind must understand and accept. Elegies can take any poetic form, but Gray employs the elegiac stanza, which was popular during his time and that he perfected. The elegiac stanza form is made up of four-line quatrains written in iambic pentameter with an abob rhyme scheme. Iambic pentameter is frequently regarded as the most natural English meter. In the case of the elegiac stanza form, iambic pentameter aids the poet in creating a pensive and stately rhythm that mirrors the subject's solemnity. Gray's pentameter's regularity and sweep reflect the gently rolling terrain of the country graveyard, allowing syntax and sense to blend naturally. Elegy written in a country churchyard is divided into five stanza groups. Stanzas 1 to 5 focus on the landscape, the country graveyard and its sounds, the terrain, the flora and fauna, and, most importantly, the physical and metaphorical stage on which Gray's meditation will take place. Stanzas 6 and 7 describe briefly but emotionally the familial and rural activities that the rude forefathers can no longer partake in. Gray explores the contrast between the wealthy classes and the common laborers in stanzas 8 to 18 the most sustained discussion of death as the great equalizer of social class. Stanzas 19 to 23 are about the village's deceased rustics and their inherent value as objects of memory. The final group, stanzas 24 to 32, contains the speaker's epitaph and describes the speaker's contemplation on how his poetic life will be remembered. The poem begins with a description of the landscape in which the speaker will meditate on death. The setting is the eponymous rural churchyard at dusk, when the lowing herd wind slowly o'er the lee, and the plowman, plods his weary way, leaving the speaker alone to contemplate the surroundings. Gray's iambic pentameter, which is appropriate for describing the gently rolling terrain, balances the solemn and formal diction with images of pastoral life. The speaker's focus shifts from the living to the dead, specifically the rude forefathers, who will remain in their narrow cell forever. Gray introduces the elegy's main characters here, rural villagers who spend their days growing crops and raising livestock and whose lives are constrained by the boundaries of their small villages. Their lowly bed, in death, resembles the straw-built shed, in which they and their families live. Their quiet death contrasts with scenes from their lives in which children scream for their sire's return to kiss him. The speaker shifts from his depiction of rural life and death in stanzas 8 to 18 to a sustained defense of the rural villagers against the wealthy and powerful classes. Let not ambition mock their useful toil their homely joys, and destiny obscure. Nor grandeur with a disdainful smile. The short and simple annals of the poor. Gray's continued attack on the wealthy and powerful's abstract attributes becomes more concrete with the personification of ambition and grandeur. Gray contrasts these characteristics with the rustic villagers' simple, honorable qualities, their useful toil, and homely joys, and concludes with the stark reality that the paths of glory lead only to the grave. Ambition, grandeur, and the villagers' domestic delights all come to an end. Gray also introduces the argument in this group of stanzas that death, the great leveler, is unconcerned about social classes among men, as evidenced by the memorials with which they hope to be remembered. The villager buried without a monument, or with only a rude monument, is in the same situation as the wealthy person buried with a storied urn or animated bust. Gray adds another dimension to his commentary on death and social status as he continues his meditation on death and social status. 
he notices that among the deceased villagers are some who had the potential to be brilliant or powerful but were denied those things due to a freak of nature. Perhaps someone buried in the churchyard had a heart once pregnant with celestial fire, evidence of a poet, or hands, that the rod of empire might have swayed. These people, on the other hand, are deprived of their full potential because chilled penury repressed their noble rage. That is, persistent poverty confines them to a life in which higher goals are impractical. Gray expands on his point by mentioning figures such as Milton and Cromwell, who represent literary and political achievement, respectively. Gray elaborates on the benefit of being born into a simple rural life, far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, in stanzas 19 to 23. This sentiment demonstrates that the speaker sympathizes with the common people rather than the wealthy. More importantly, rural life, the cool sequestered veil of life, protects the villagers from the blushes of ingenuous shame, the corruption that comes with city life. Gray insists on an imperative in this section. No matter what social class one is in, one must be remembered and have a marker to memorialize one's death. Gray's speaker imagines how he will be remembered in stanzas 24 to 32. Gray employs the persona of a villager to describe his speaker's actions and death as the village poet. The epitaph on his tombstone describes his defining feature. He was marked by melancholy and, like the other villagers, he was a youth to fortune and to fame unknown. Thank you for listening to our book summary. I hope we sparked your interest in the book. Please let us know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. Do you want to listen to more book summaries? Subscribe to us and you will get a notification every time we publish a new summary. Bye bye and see you next time.